Dr. Ed Show. I'm Dr. Edmund Sokowski. You know we are about health and wellness. We don't diagnose, nor do we treat, but we hope to educate and inform so that you are empowered about your health and wellness. You can find me every Saturday morning live at AM 1250 The Answer at 9 a.m. from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. And we talk about all the health and wellness topics and have m m wonderful guests make you educated and informed. Because the whole idea is about you being in charge of your own health and wellness in your life. You can also find me on Rumble.com, Spotify, and a bunch of other websites, including RoseUnplugged.com, where every week I write a weekly article. We have a wonderful show today. I'm really excited about my guest today. He's been on my radio show, Health and Wellness with Dr. Ed. And we have a topic that I think is going to hit home with every viewer because the subject today, if you haven't gone through this, you know someone who has. Let's welcome Dr. Tim Murphy. Great Dr. To be with Tim, you, thanks right. for coming on, Dr. on Great our show. Yeah, sure. You, you know, Dr. Murphy, if you all remember, was a congressman, a congressman for this district, in mm -hmm. fact. And a state senator for this district. And a state, state senator before that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's uh, being involved in politics, I think, really broadens your scope and, and enlightens you, I think. Mm -hmm. At least I'm not, I'm not in politics, but I'm aware of enough of it to see that. That should be the case. Uh, but Dr. Murphy is a psychologist, is a mental health advocate, and an author of a wonderful book, The Christ Cure. And we're going to talk about this book today. So, Dr. Tim, I don't think there's a person listening to us today or walking this planet that hasn't experienced stress, anxiety, depression. So, what I want to do in starting of the show today is for you to define stress, anxiety, because I think that's what we mostly experience, what causes them, and then kind of contrast the two, because I think people mix those two up. Wow, what a great question. And first of all, thanks for having me here. It's my pleasure. Um, so stress are uh, external or internal pressures upon us to perform, and it could be running through daily routines or generally not stressful. Um, work, school can be stressful if it, if it pushes us to uh, perform more. Certainly exercise has its own level of stress. But stress is not necessarily bad. If we lead a life that's non-stressful, we don't have any issues going on, no pressure of any kind, we actually are not ready then for inevitable stress. If something comes up where you're under pressure of time or work, performance, something there. But stress can also reach a level where there's such a demand on us. It could be physical stress of too cold, too hot, um, burdens too heavy, uh, things beyond our physical abilities. It could also be mental stresses of things we have to perform on, whether it's a test or doing things at work, and emotional stresses where uh, pressures come on us from new relationships, broken relationships, uh, conflicts at, at work or school, all those can come up. So those are the external stresses on us. How does good health or poor health influence that stress factor? Well, um, good health m makes it better, bad health makes it worse, and uh, mental attitudes towards those things can make physical health worse. So a person who is not in good physical shape, um, uh, who uh, does not work out, does not eat right, uh, does not have healthy uh, habits of sleep, etc., the ability to handle stress plummets. So when a person's at work schedule, generally we need about seven to nine hours of sleep. And if people push themselves, particularly adolescents and young adults, it's interesting, adolescents oftentimes need as much sleep as toddlers. Uh, they, they need a, a nine or 10 hours of sleep, but they push it, um, but uh, need seven to, to nine hours. Too little sleep does not allow the brain to do what it does at night. It's really cool, you probably know this, but the cells um, throughout our body, when cells spend energy, they give off waste materials and we get rid of it through the kidneys, right? It goes out to the veins and out. But the brain is different because the brain cells do their, um, their, their, their uh, waste matter goes into brain fluid, cerebral spinal fluid. And that, there's a barrier between that and the veins with these support cells like this. And during the daytime, those support cells are tight. So you're not cleaning the brain out. At nighttime, they open up and then they can clean out. What happens is people who are sleep deprived, the brain builds up its level of toxic chemicals, whatever in there. That's just one more stress factor on us if we're not healthy. People who are in better health, work out, uh, eat right, they're better able to handle stress. And that's why those things are so critically important. I think 
That really hits home with a lot of people, Tim, because today I think we're overstimulated. And, you know, we have all this information that's thrown us on, on TV, all this information that's thrown us on these, on these things, mm -hmm. you know, that constantly we're getting pinged and dinged, and, and it's like almost information overload. Yes. Does that create a, a particular type of stress? Absolutely. It's a very important type of stress, which we have now, which the human being wasn't programmed for. When you think of the thousands of years that we've walked the earth, people had time to plant crops, to reap uh, crops, to, to cook, to hunt, all those things. It took time. We're so inundated with information now, we do not have time to think about it. Um, when you look at Twitter and TikTok and, and uh, Instagram, they're providing bits of information, tiny bits of information, but nothing is connected. So they, they work on just entertainment value to get your attention. But our brain is designed to really think through things, to analyze it, to problem solve. That's what the front of our brain is developed for. Everything behind that is more reptilian or lower mammal but we're not using it that much anymore, and when we don't use it, we cannot calm ourselves down when under stress. Can that be self-induced? Oh, sure, uh, because we, we keep seeking the stimulation to uh, emotional stimulation or those, those, those uh, core uh, lower uh, brain level things to just stimulate and stay happy and get the endorphins or the other chemicals going to the brain, um, and, and we can keep going with that. But this is where your question about anxiety comes in, which is so important. Let's consider most stress is external, but we can also create it in ourselves. It's self-induced. So anxiety is about memories or imagination. I like to say anxiety is the past, worries about the future, just to help us about that. But things that worries about the future don't exist. Anxiety is about the past, doesn't exist. Right. They're in our imagination. And when we face trauma in our life, and it could be the death of someone, maybe there's a horrific incident that occurs, a bad auto accident, uh, losing a job, a, a divorce, anything like that. The first thing that happens is the trauma event itself overwhelms us. The system says this is too much to handle right now. Um, and, and chronic stress, chronic high levels of stress can have the same impact, a child living in poverty or war, et cetera. But what happens is when this, when this event occurs, our brain has this flashbulb memory. And it's interesting to talk to a soldier, a fireman, a policeman, a doctor, or anybody who's been through a traumatic event. They can probably tell you exactly what the scene was like, what it smelled like, the taste in the air, the sounds. I remember when I was in a rollover accident in Iraq one time, even saying that now I can taste the sand and I can smell what it was like there in that scene that takes place. So that's the flashbulb memory. But you know what? You can't change it. And when people have a trauma, they think, well, if only I had done this, if only I could have changed this, if only I wasn't there at that moment, or maybe none of those things can change anything. I tell my clients, you cannot unset the sun. Once it's down, it's down, you can't bring it back up. But the next thing we do is we have this loop memory, and the memory loop will go over the traumatic event hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times. But it's just a memory. It doesn't exist anymore. But our brain is trying to make sense of what happens. We keep going over and over and over again. And here's the thing our brain does too, back to your question on self-induced. We change it. There's parts we forget. There's parts we add in. There's parts we switch a little bit. And because of that, we make the event even more troublesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and that anxiety builds. And here's what happens physically to us. Part of our brain called the amygdala, you know, big as the tip of our thumb. And it's a really important part of the brain that's allowed us to survive for thousands of years. It allows us to survive things. It sets up the fight or flight response. But when the amygdala gets triggered, I, I say it's, it's kind of like the smoke detector in your house. Very important, but it's kind of dumb. Because the smoke detector and your amygdala does not know the difference between the house is on fire and grandma just blew out the birthday candles. <laughs> so there's a lot of smoke in the room. So the same thing, when the amygdala has this memory of what's going on, it sets up the whole fight or flight response again. All these hormones surge through your body and you get this sensation of anxiety. That's the adrenaline? That's the adrenaline. That's another one called cortisol. It's another one called cytokines. And the cytokines are an inflammatory, this pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory. And that inflammation also affects the brain and it gives us a sensation. You know, I, the key word is it gives us a sensation, the sensation which we interpret as depression, which we interpret as anxiety, but it may not necessarily be that. I'll give you a little example. So I'm going to say certain symptoms, and you tell me what emotion you think it is. Heart's racing, you know, chest pounding, breathing is rapid, starting to sweat, pupils dilate. What's the emotion? 
Well, I don't think I want to go there, but th it could be a lot of things. It could be a lot of things, but yeah. many people say it's fear. It's fear. <laughs> Anxiety. It, it could be love. It is love. That's right. That's exactly the description. <laughs> I tell people, remember when you were in middle school, that first love, that that's the sensation. But what happens is if we get to be adults, we interpret that instead as, I must be under attack, and all the things take place. So the initial event, the loop memory, and then here's the third thing. This is when we have the reaction, reaction. This is when we, we have this sensation of anxiety, sensation of depression. We start to, to conclude, I must really be in bad shape. There's no hope for me. There's no one that can help me. I can't get out of this. Maybe I shouldn't survive. Maybe I should hurt, harm myself, escape. All those, get drunk, whatever it is. People start to go for escapes from something there. And this is really important for people to understand that's not a reality. We're, we, we confuse ourselves in thinking that all these things are occurring. No one is out there. No one can help me. And say, so, you know what? We're, we've all been there. We've all struggled. But when we don't have uh, much stamina for stress, when we don't understand our own sensations, we, and we don't understand that this is our brain a little bit misfiring, we make these terrible interpretations. And that's one of the reasons why um, among adolescents and young adults, in the post-COVID era, since all the shutdowns and isolation have taken place, the rates of depression have doubled, the rates of anxiety have doubled, suicide rates have continued to climb, drug overdose and drug overdose death rates have continued to soar because people are, are collapsing. They don't know what to do. And, and my book is written about helping people know there is a lot you can do. There's a lot we can have power to do. Well, I think that part of this media thing is this constant bombardment of all this, all this information. It's all negative. It's never mm -hmm. positive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, 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 you're being beat up and beat up and beat up. And, and I, I think we in, tend to interpret some of this stuff, and, and we feel so oppressed and suppressed and feel that there's no way out. And I think that's where you're leading to as far as depression comes. Yes. But there are some te techniques to deal with stress that I think that you can do, you can do yourself. And if you're not capable of that, you seek professional help from people like yourself mm -hmm. that can advise you and, and train you on how to do things. So let, let me talk about a little technique that I used to have. And I came upon this by myself. I used to get in bed and study. You know, when we went to school, all we did was study, 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 study. And I would get in my bed and study, and then I had trouble falling asleep. Be up half the night because I was just thinking about what I studied. And my bed, even if I didn't study, I'd get in bed, have trouble falling asleep. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, I'm I'm working hard, I'm studying hard, and you know, going to school, part-time job, what, what, whatever all that was. And I think I'm being overwhelmed. But what I realized was, I was associating where I sleep with where I was studying. Mm -hmm. And I stopped it immediately. I studied in another room at a drawing table mm -hmm. and never took my book, never took my notes, never did anything to that bed. That's right. My sleeping changed just like that. What a, what a brilliant way to do that because you change that association. The same thing in people, um, so sleep problems can be trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep, waking up during the night, and, and then waking up too early. And uh, that's one of the prime things to do with good sleep hygiene. Bed is for sleeping. And if a person wakes up at night and they start taking out their cell phone and scrolling through things, the light from the screen will wake them up, the thinking there, nope. If you're having trouble falling asleep, I tell people the last thing you do is watch TV or look at your phone or laptop. Go to another room and actually read a paper book if you want to read that. And don't read something exciting, read something boring yeah, it's <laughs> to get yourself calmed down again. See, I can use the TV to fall asleep. I grew up my whole life, always had a TV or radio beside my bed. Mm -hmm. But if I listen to something new on TV, it keeps me up. If I play the same thing over and over again that I heard a lot, I'll fall asleep, the TV shuts off, I'm good. So it's kind of interesting how you can interplay those, those things to work for you. But I think the trick is understanding what they do and how they do it. Mm -hmm. And I, reading is a good one because your, your mind starts to actually calm down unless you're reading something that, that's sensuous or exciting mm -hmm. and then, mm -hmm. then your mind's going to gear up. So what are some of the other techniques for good sleep? Because sleep is the only time your body heals. Your mind, That's your right. body, everything heals when you sleep. So you need to get into that good night's sleep. So another important thing is the hour or so before you go to bed, wind down. Um, if you're going to exercise, don't exercise, then go to bed. Um, watch also caffeine and stimulants people take in the evening. Uh, when I worked on an aircraft carrier, one of the sailors came to me because he had, been, he had trouble sleeping. And he'd fall asleep like 1 or 2 in the morning, and it was really struggling. 
So we checked through a number of things, uh, and it turns out he was working out around five or six o'clock and taking all these pills, and one of them was a 450 milligram caffeine pill. Well, it takes six hours just to reach the half-life. So that's it. Another part is, so begin calming activities, changing the lighting. But another thing with sleep is so important is breathing exercises. Now, here's a technique um, that's really important. It's called the box breathing. So this is one where you would inhale slowly for four seconds, hold your breath for four seconds, exhale slowly for four seconds, and hold your breath for four seconds. And then do that for a few minutes. Uh, there's apps you can look at to actually help with that too, but that actually uh, leads the body and the brain to calm down. The sympathetic nervous system gets us excited, the parasympathetic nervous system calms it down. And when you start doing the box breathing and slow concentration, it actually slows the heart rate, all those uh, stimulating hormone in your system start to deplete, and that's part of it. There's another technique, which is briefer, a three, seven, inhale th for three, exhale for seven, uh, and uh, which helps calm down during the day in little times when you don't have time in a classroom or on the road. Don't do box breathing when you're driving, you'll fall asleep. But other times during the day, um, watch professional baseball players. Watch basketball players when they're doing the foul shots, and they usually go, that calms them down, helps them concentrate. They teach that technique. Coaches teach that technique to people. You also see them professional kickers, but not every lineman does that because they want to be pumped up. Um, but that's another method for that too. And even the foods you eat. Uh, don't take junk foods and stimulating foods before sugar. you go to bed. Oh, sugars, yeah. carbs. It takes a long time for sugar to process out. And it actually creates this insulin cortisol uh, exactly. response. So you mentioned the fight and flight, which I think is really important. Would you explain what fight, fight and flight uh, experience is? Yeah, when we, when we perceive we are under attack, uh, and, and that, that system can be not just a person threatening us, so not just the saber-toothed tiger or the snarling dog at us, but it could be a smell that says, wow, this, this smells like something burning, or uh, a, a frightening scene what we're looking at, or, or scary sounds. Um, our body wants to do something about it. So fight means basically what that word means. We're getting ready to, uh, to uh, defend ourselves through attack back, and flight means get the heck out of there. There's a third thing that happens when we're overwhelmed, and that is freeze. We just, you know, the, the possum or the hummingbird just, just stops moving and, and those elements. We can train ourselves to handle that better. The person who, uh, we all recognize that in some time in life, we're gonna be under some stressful situation and we may be assaulted someday, so it does behoove us sometimes to learn some personal defense techniques. I can usually run fast <laughs> better at that. But those are some things, too. That's the fight-or-flight response. So when that happens, and it happens uh, in nature, like you said, uh, something's going to attack us, uh, I think, originally, or we have to defend ourselves because someone is attacking us. But certain body systems shut down in order for that to happen. Yes. That's the problem when this system has gone into effect by things that we're doing mm -hmm. or things that we may be interpreting incorrectly, we're shutting down these symptoms and these effects of this cortisol and, right. and epinephrine and all this stuff are, are having a negative impact on us. Right, we, uh, our immune system begins to shut down. Um, uh, pain we perceive uh, much easier. So a person who's under this fight or flight and stress hormones of the system, two people, one with a high stress, one without, this person will perceive pain much higher. Um, you end up with uh, aches in the joints, the knees, hips, uh, ankles, etc. You put on weight. Um, uh, skin problems can occur. People may break out. They may get fever, blisters, sores, hair problems. All these things to occur. Uh, a lot of gastrointestinal problems, more stomach aches, digestive problems occur too, because the body is ready to fight. So it says you don't need blood in your guts. You don't yeah. need. Let's let's get ready. You don't need to digest your food. Yeah, you, you don't, don't need, need it. it. Yeah, you need, and and this is why our minds in in our 21st 20th century America. We're, we're ruining our body's ability to fight things off. So let's talk about two different things that may be the, kind of the same thing. One is meditation and one is prayer. Mm. And they may be kind of similar. Oh, tell, tell us about meditation first. Well, let me add four things to that. One is relaxation. We need to take time in our lives just to relax. It is that calm walk. It is doing things with family. It's dinner time with family. We know those kind of things help people overall. It isn't doing something that's intense and fighting. That's got to be relaxing. Number two, um, mindfulness. Mindfulness is being aware in the moment. So like right now, we'd be aware the feeling of sitting on this couch, the quietness in the room, our own breathing, our own heart rate, to be mindful in the moment. But the cool thing about mindfulness, if it doesn't belong there, it's not allowed in. 
So thinking about the past and thinking about the future doesn't belong. So a person who decides to walk through the woods or sit, call me, listen to music, you're paying full attention to that and you don't let anything else in. So it's, it's this awareness. Meditation focuses in. And meditation then, uh, starting off with maybe some sequential breathing to calm down, sometimes something else we call progressive muscle relaxation. So you start off tensing the toes for 10 seconds, relax them. Tensing the ball of the foot, the ankle, the, work your way up through muscle groups and relax them. But really trying to calm the mind down, but not empty the mind. Because I think when we empty our minds and just say, let the universe speak to us, it's very scary for a person with anxiety. But if we say instead, concentrate on a word or a phrase that's positive, affirmational for us, um, that, that, that's, that we can really repeat over and over and over again. And the reason the repetition is so important, particularly for a person who is a, having a hard time calming down, is they're already meditating the wrong way. I'm a failure, I'm a loser, I can't do this, life is terrible, nothing's ever gonna work for me, I can't pass this, my boss hates me, whatever it is. People are meditating on negatives. And you know what? You say something often enough and you're going to believe it. Cognitive dissonance. Yes, uh, so we, we believe that. So the next level, so relaxation, mindfulness, meditation, prayer is part of solitude. So solitude is that point where I say, when you're totally alone and totally comfortable with the company you keep. Now this, a lot of people have trouble with because if we have a lot of racing thoughts, a lot of difficult thoughts, we don't want to go there. And prayer becomes one of those ways where you have this conversation with God. If I could say Mother Teresa talked about this. Dan Rather interviewed her once. So what, what do you say to God when you pray? She said, I don't say anything. I just listen. And then he says, well, then what does God say to you? And she said, he doesn't say anything. He just listens. Mm -hmm. She was able to have this immense solitude and comfort with it, which we should all aspire to. But I do caution people, don't just use things of clearing your mind because negative thoughts and evil thoughts can creep in. You want to control it, and prayer is one of the ways you can do that and ask for help. So there are some people that live in the past, and they're still living and reliving and reliving events that occurred, mother and father divorced, mm -hmm. uh, car accidents, what, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. How does someone move on from that? Well, there's two major steps to this. One is acceptance. And the second part is commitment. It is a tough thing when I work with people who experience trauma and they want to talk about their traumatic event, but very often it's from the standpoint of wanting it to change. And at some point, through humility, through honesty, uh, it's a matter of saying, I just have to accept that's what it is. I cannot change that. I can change how I'm dealing with it now, but I cannot, I cannot change what's there. And then commit to moving forward. Now, part of this, when we've had a very traumatic event, one of the things we experience is guilt. Is there something else I should have done, could have done, would have done? But guilt is an appropriate emotion if we have made a mistake. And when we have guilt, we need to go and, and ask for someone to forgive us, to uh, make reparations, whatever that is, to confess what we've done wrong. Because that guilt can lead to depression. Yeah, oh, it does. Well, even more so is shame. Guilt is, I made a mistake. Shame is, I am a mistake. God made a mistake when God created me. There's no way out of this. Nobody likes me. I, I can't get away from this. You can't break away from shame, but you can break free from guilt. And part of that is also saying that um, with guilt, it's, it's understanding too, if you're not responsible, don't take responsibility. But a lot of times we'll blame ourselves for things we're not responsible for. But I say the next step from that, helping people free up, is forgiveness. Do we condemn ourselves? Do we serve as detective, judge, jury, prosecutor, uh, uh, jail warden? We can't break out of that. Forgiveness is different. Forgiveness of ourselves, forgiveness of other people, and, 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 and it, is, it is tough. And I know in our lives, when we've made mistakes, when we feel we've betrayed someone, abandoned someone, harmed someone, it's very tough to forgive ourselves it, and very tough to forgive someone else. And it happens, that's why we call it a mistake. It's yeah. not like it's willful intent most of the time. Well, and, and even if someone has done something with willful intent and later realizes, wow, I, I should not have done that, to try and make amends and if the other person doesn't forgive you, because the way I look at it is God forgives, others might, I must. This is one of the most difficult things, but, I'm, uh, but I know that if we live a life with grudges and anger and attacking everybody and ourselves all the time, you can't break free. Uh, we're called upon to forgive each other, and a lot of people will not let you forgive. They'll continue to attack. We all know what that's like. But 
we can't move forward unless we do that. And that's one of the ways we can let go of the past, still respect the past. We're not denying the people we loved or things we could have done. We're still there. But we're saying part of it is moving forward. So you got to get over the past in order to be in, pre in the present, because if you're not living in the present, you're not living your life. That's kind of the way I feel about it. But there always is a future, but should we be worrying about the future? Well, it, it doesn't help to worry about the future. Plan for the future, yes. Prepare for the future, yes. But live in a future where you're thinking of every possible bad thing that goes wrong, you're just getting your brain pumped up again to fight or flight yeah. and getting your body so stressed. And when you stress your body, you weaken your ability to handle problems. So it's the very thing wrong. Um, I understand that um, a former coach of Notre Dame uh, would write on the blackboard N period, no, no, W period, I period, N period. And said, okay, what does that mean? And the player says, oh, it means win. Coach says, no, it means what's important now. When you're on the field, when you're making this play, think only this play. Not the last one, especially if you muffed it. Not the next one, not after the game, not going out on a date, not a test coming up next week, not going to Thanksgiving with your parents. No, what's important now? And, and, and not, not things in the past too. Uh, those are ways of clearing your minds. I had the incredible honor once of playing golf with Arnold Palmer. You know, he's a good golfer. He had, yeah, but <laughs> wasn't. But I asked him what he does with the stroke. He says, this is the only thing that matters right now, is this particular stroke right now in golf. We need to learn those kind of things in life now. Focus on what we have. And that's where meditation can help too. Focus on what we have, learn to focus, prepare for that. It takes work, it takes practice. But the more we do it, the better we get. You know, I used to, in my profession, and I'm doing surgeries almost every day and all different procedures, and you're dealing with the public and their concerns and their health issues and, and everything that's involved in a medical practice. And I used to look what I'm doing the next day and the day after and look at the procedures and look at the patients and do all that stuff. I'd come home and have trouble sleeping because my mind was, okay, I've got to do this and I hope this got to come out right. You know, all that, all that stuff that goes into that. And I learned a technique that I don't even look at it. I walk in in the morning and look at the patient right before I, I see that patient. I look at their medical records. I look at their, their history, all of that. Look at their x-rays, whatever the procedure is going to be for that, for that day on them. And this way I'm not taking it home. But there are times where, you know, in, in the medical life, your intent is to do something you want it 100% perfect. Nothing is perfect. Only our creator is. We're mm -hmm. certainly not. And it's only 80% or 90% out the right outcome that you were looking for. It's hard not to take that back home with you. It is hard. And I experience that same thing too. Yes, yeah, certainly when I see clients and I think, am I, did I handle that right? Or they have these issues and how am I going to help them with that? Or are they going to follow through? What, all those questions we have over and over again. But everybody does that in their career. It just has to be at some point you say, I have to let that go. I have to move forward. I have to prepare for that or else I'm not going to be able to handle the next situation. It takes See, a lot of practice. Here, here's an interesting thing. I tore my medial meniscus hiking in Arizona in four places and, and I'm avoiding surgery. And one of the ways that I'm doing that is I started Pilates. And so every night I leave the office and I go right to Pilates. What I, and it's helping, I'll say that. But the other thing that it's helping with, when you're doing Pilates, for that hour, 50 minutes, whatever it is, the only thing I'm thinking about is what that instructor is asking of me and what I have to do mm. and not hurt my knee in the process. All the events of the day are gone during that one hour. That's, that's almost a form of controlling that cortisol and then it insulin is. And, and epinephrine and all of that. Because you're burning off the stress hormones in your body when you're exercising. That's a very, very important part of it. You're getting your mind to do something else. One of the important ways of handling stress and trauma is to do something unrelated. Uh, uh, mental stimulation, exercise, whatever that is, do something unrelated. It helps us to redirect ourselves. Yeah. And so playing sports, walking, mm -hmm. riding your bike, all these things help take you away from that stress of the day. Uh, Plus they're physically good for your physical, emotional, mental health. I mean, otherwise you, you come home and you're grumpy and you yell at the kids or the spouse and end up with more problems there and then those backfire and then more fights go on and then you can't sleep. We, we, we're humans are, are really good at getting into messes um, and we're not following the techniques we need to do that we, we can have to get out of them. You know, Dr. Tim Murphy, we're at the break already. It's, it was the fast first segment of the show. When we come back, I want to learn a little bit about your history, and then we want to focus on this amazing book that you wrote. 
We'll be back with the Dr. Ed Show after our break. Welcome back to the Dr. Ed Show. We're here with Dr. Tim Murphy, and we're discussing some important topics that I know hit home. Stress, anxiety, depression. But we're going to learn a little bit about Dr. Tim Murphy at this segment of the show that has actually led him to writing a book. So let's start, Dr. Tim. Why a psychologist? Um, I, that started years ago in my life, and I think it was because in my own life I dealt with a lot of problems I was inflicted upon me. I had, uh, you know, sad to say, a, a father who was alcoholic. Uh, we did not have much money. What, much, what money we had, he oftentimes drank away. Uh, there was 11 kids in the family. Um, we, uh, we struggled there. Um, he was sometimes violent with my mother. Uh, and sometimes for events that I do not even remember, but my sisters have told me, about instances where he was hitting my mother and I came in and intervened and to this day I cannot remember any of that. Um, so it was because of your age you don't remember or because you I, blocked that out? I was probably a young teenager at the time but I think sometimes things are just very traumatic you block it out yeah. and, it, uh, and, the, and there it sits. Um, in my life I, uh, I had this sensitivity towards helping other people particularly kids and I um, actually, when I was choosing majors for college, um, you take all these exams of it, vocational interest tests and things like that, and I thought I wanted to be a lawyer and a politician, and didn't, it turned out very low. So one of my uh, teachers said, you ought to be a psychologist. You'd be good at that. Okay. I checked the box. I loved it. Took the courses in college, graduate school, and, and really liked the idea of helping, particularly helping youth and, and young adults. It was my calling to do that, and sensitize to those that are struggling a lot in their lives. So where do you rank in the family of 11? Fourth. So two girls, another so boy right, than me. Right in the middle. Middle like, child. Like myself. Yeah, we're supposed to be well adjusted. We're yeah, well, uh, we, I think we are. But, <laughs> but you're a, you were probably an interpreter between the, the older ones and the younger ones. Yeah, right? in fact, my mother would take the older kids where you were all assigned a younger kid to take care of. And I'm thinking, well, I'm 10 years old and I have someone, or 8 years old and I have to take care of someone already? She says, yeah, that's the way it is. It's a big family. Deal with it. And undergrad school was where? Um, undergrad was at Wheeling uh, University, Wheeling Jesuit University, and then on to uh, my master's degree, degree at Cleveland State University and my PhD at Pitt, University of Pittsburgh. So, uh, psychology, I think, is a very interesting field because a lot of it, beyond your education, is really listening and observing. Isn't, mm -hmm. isn't that really what you do? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, and, and feedback and, and provide other information. And, and then once you... You, you observe all of this and you're listening to somebody's life history or their circumstances, but you have to come up with a plan in order to circumvent their issues. Is, uh, is that a good way of saying it? Yeah, it, it is one way. So what happens is we develop what we call attitudes towards everything in life, people, places, things. And an attitude is made up of a thought, a feeling, and a behavior. What we think about something affects how we feel about it, it affects how we behave towards it, whether it's choosing a car or a food or a friend, whatever that is. But what happens is when we get emotionally overwhelmed, sometimes it's, it's the physical sensations which, which lead to those emotions, but more often than not, it's a thought. Life should be fair and it's not. No one should ever bother me. I want things to be my way or I can never be better or I will be a failure. Whatever it is, that thought will lead to a feeling. Now, many times when a person is stressed or depressed or, or, or anxious, they'll take medication for that. And medication may be helpful, but it changes how you feel and it doesn't change how you think. Put you kind of that num numbing zombie mode. Yeah, for many people they find, yeah, yeah I, I'm not, I have no more lows, but I don't have highs anymore. Or in fact, um, most people, the first time they take an antidepressant, it doesn't work for them. Maybe out of 30, some out of 100. By the time they get to the fourth medication, it's about six out of 100. So um, medication can be helpful. We're not dismissing it, but it's not the only thing. Counseling takes place when working with someone where I'm listening for how they process information, how they view the world. Does it make sense? Are they logical? 
in this too. Are, are they demanding things in the world that the world can't uh, produce? Are they too caught up in the past and not able to deal with the moment? So the role of a counselor or a psychologist there is to help them reflect back and saying to change the way they're thinking about things. Whether they're uh, upset about something that happened to them in childhood or at work today or whatever it is, to help them put the pieces back together and reflect with them to look at the world a different way. Change the way they think, can change the way they feel, then you gotta change how you act too. So trauma can have a big impact. What is the definition, what's the medical definition of trauma? Well, uh, trauma here is something that in the psychological sense too, is it's when it's perceived as a life-threatening or limb-threatening event to yourself, someone close to you that you witness. Um, seeing a scary movie is not traumatic. Um, having a fender better a vendor accident is not trauma. It could be stressful, but it's not to that level where you think, wow, I could have really lost it here. I was driving the other day on a highway, and <clears throat> I did not realize the car in front of me had slowed to a stop, was, did not have its brake lights on. And um, I think it was going about 60 miles an hour, and then suddenly, you know, the, uh, the car is now, the, the, it lights up and hits your brakes. And you heard this thing that says, you know, collision assist. And I realized, wow, I'm about to have an accident. Hit the brake hard, swerved into the uh, uh, other lane, the empty lane, and went four car lengths before I could stop. Wow. Now imagine that. If I'd hit that car, I would have been dead. Now, at that point, I said, okay, I'm, I'm good. I did a quick check and I didn't have that feeling. Now, another person may have such a sensation to be overwhelmed by that. Uh, of that event. I was in a rollover accident in Iraq. Wasn't life-threatening, didn't have that reaction, stressed for a lot while in pain. But what happens for people is uh, if, they, if this overwhelming sensation, now this also can come if a person has a sudden um, loss of a job and they say, oh my gosh, I have no more finances, I can't support myself. Um, or, or if someone is um, suddenly told, I'm leaving you, the relationship's over. Those are traumas. The other ones are ma major stresses, mega stresses. So like if a project doesn't work out at work, if we fail a test, it is not the end of the world, it's not end of life. But if we label it as traumatic, if we label it as life-threatening, we can make it awful. So it's what really happens and not just what we think about it. Yeah, because what can be traumatic to me is not traumatic to you. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's the way we perceive it and the way I think we integrate it. Um, and chronic stress can have that effect too. So if day after day after day we're struggling with something and not getting a resolution to it, and we're, we don't pause to think, hey, wait a minute, uh, I can change the way I think about this. Those stresses can build up. And by the way, those can be, have a big impact upon the brain too. Where the amygdala, that fear center of the brain, fight flight center, actually slightly increases. Another part that wraps around it called the hippocampus, which is the short-term, long-term memory grand central station, starts to uh, reduce in size. And that's why many people who have chronic stress and trauma say, I can't think right anymore. I'm in a mental fog. I don't remember things anymore. I looked for my car keys the other day and I eventually found them in the refrigerator. You know, strange <laughs> things like that. Or I, I don't even know where I parked. Um, I, a friend of mine was in a, um, at, uh, at one of the tragic shootings in the Pittsburgh area. And he said it took him an hour to find his way home. He lived a mile from the location. He just got lost. He couldn't find it. That overwhelming with the traumatic effects. Yeah, and a car wreck, shooting, surgery. Uh, you know, life-threatening situations too. Yeah. Um, but this is where it, it, it depends so much on how we label it. That's really important. Uh, that the person who says, I can make it, I can do this, I can overcome this, this is tough, but other people have had it worse than me, and, and, and this is where I like to teach people lessons about other people where we, sh we swap stories about that. Not to demean or not to diminish what they feel, to say, I recognize, yeah, that was a bad situation, but it's not an end of your life situation, and it's not an impossible situation. When people see themselves as victims forever, they can't get out of it. It's like the boulder is crushing them, and they're victims forever. That's level one. The next level is survivors. This happened to me, I'm gonna have to make it, I'm gonna have to get on with my life, I'm gonna survive. The third level is thriving, to say, you know what? This happened to me, and I'm gonna find meaning and purpose in my life and be stronger, not despite this, but because of this. That's the level we wanna be stuck in. That's where we wanna to, to aim towards that. Yeah. Tough to do, but uh, when you meet people who have been to hell and back, it's powerful. I know what it's like. That, that's turning lemon into lemonade concept, kind y of. Yeah, huh? more than that. It's yeah. almost like turning poison into, yeah. uh, into uh, lemonade, yeah. yeah. And th that can be a mindset. Yeah, well, the way out of it is a mindset because you're not going to change what happened. Um, we want to. You know, I look back on my life, wish I could change a lot of things. I can't. 
um, all of us have that experience. What, what's, what's that saying? Um, oh, to have the, uh, that's a saying that says, uh, Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and to have the wisdom to know the difference. And those are prof that's profound words when you really think about it. Yeah. So you have trauma that can, that can, trauma can destroy somebody's lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, bad car accident and you, you become crippled and it's, it's a whole new dynamic for the rest mm -hmm. of your life and, 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 you know, what you're gonna go through. What's the difference between trauma and tragedy? Well. And so the impacts. Yeah, you know, well the psychological impact of both may be similar. Uh, a tragedy, losing all sorts of uh, things, and it could be losing a limb, it could be losing friends, it could be the fire, the tornado, the hurricane. Uh, the tragedies occur. Uh, trauma is to the level where that psychological builds up inside of us to cause problems. And PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is when the symptoms now are, are so severe, it keeps us from functioning day to day. So you have to have some trauma, some tragedy to get the PS, PTSD? Yeah, you can't have PTSD without the trauma. You can't have the T. So it isn't just, I've got some weaknesses in life. We can feel anxious and depressed about things, but post-traumatic stress disorder, post, after the trauma, stress is there's a lot of severe stress has occurred, but the disorder is when our lives become very jittery with anxiety, with depression. We avoid situations, places, and people that remind us of the event. We may be troubled by nightmares, sleep disorders, eating problems, um, physical ailments that come from that, uh, uh, and uh, not having a hard time to shake it, and also flashbacks. A little reminder can throw us back in a second of the scene. A smell, mm -hmm. uh, a picture of something, yep. a comment somebody makes. Yep. All those little things can trigger us back. Um, and what happens is the, the idea is not to avoid everything. The idea to get over it is to be exposed to those things. Like I mentioned before, when I was in a rollover accident in Iraq, and every time I say that, I can taste the sand uh, there. And I'm not afraid of sand. Uh, but when I go to a beach and the dust kicks up the sand, it goes, oh, it reminds me of that scene. But there's other times, too, when people will have, uh, like I've talked to a, a, a police officer who was in a scene where someone died. And it was horrific for him to see the conditions there. Blood has a certain smell. When he smells blood again, he goes back into that scene. And it's important for him to work through that. Uh, we, we all have those sorts of things. Sometimes people remember the smell of an operating room, smell of a hospital, um, uh, or, or, or a certain scene. Or side. And I, when people are troubled by those, there's things you can do to overcome those. And that's where working with a professional can help you so you don't have your life ruled by these triggers. Are there certain professions that you're more prone to have the PTSD? Um, you know, it, th it's interesting. There's like three levels of, of, of trauma. One is those totally random acts you cannot control. The auto accident, the natural disaster, um, the, 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 the crime against someone, you can't control that. There's other ones where uh, by, by a person's profession, they're more exposed to it. The soldier, policeman, fireman, uh, frontline medical people, emergency room, uh, burn units, um, things like that people who are working more with people who are exposed to a lot of trauma. Uh, those are ones who may have it, but it can happen to anybody. Either of those can happen to anybody. The third one is when we inflict trauma on ourselves through our stupid decisions. Selfish, um, dumb uh, things that happen to us in life where we end up harming ourselves or other people. And let's face it, we all do that too. How do we know we have PTSD? When, when a person reaches the point over several months when they're overwhelmed with depression, anxiety, avoidance, sleep problems, um, flashbacks and triggers, that's the time uh, to look at this other level. Now some people will linger for years and years and years and never change it. In part they never want to change it. They identify with their symptoms. They become their symptoms. And it's hard to shake them out of that unless they want to move forward. Is, is that key, wanting to change? Wanting you know, to so what I ask people, um, and this actually comes from some biblical things too, <clears throat> when I look in the Bible, when someone who has uh, wants to be healed, want healed, the Lord goes up to them and says, do you want to walk? Do you want to see? Do you want, do you want to be healed there? Um, some may come up with leprosy or some other disease and they're asking for help. So what I will ask people, uh, tell me your story and go through that and I recognize the pain they're in. I say, well, let me ask this question. Do you want to heal or do you want to hurt? And then I listen for their answer. And some people say, well, I don't want to hurt. Well, that wasn't the question. Do you want to heal or do you want to hurt? Well, what's involved? We're not negotiating. I just want to know where you want to go and I'll help you get there. But if you want to hurt, I'm not going to help you with that. <clears throat> and 
<clears throat> people will say, I've even heard people say, well, I don't want to be an alcoholic anymore, but can I still drink? I don't want to be a drug addict anymore, but can I have heroin occasionally? I literally had someone say that to me. But we also do that with other things in our life. Well, I want to repair these relationships, but can I still ignore people and be selfish? No, you can't. We, making a decision to heal is a very important part. But I understand it's scary. I, when I talk about healing from trauma, sometimes it's the most uh, difficult work you may do. But the, the outcome is worth the journey. And this is where uh, I believe that, uh, I mean, I know that making those decisions to move forward is part. But you know what? We start to move forward. We slip back. We start to move forward. We slip back a couple times. And then people start to think, maybe I can't get better. I said, no, no, that's part of it. Because biblically, even when you look at characters in the Bible who've gone forward, they mess up. The classic example is one of the apostles, Peter. Um, he was chosen to be, you know, on this rock, I'll build my church. But then he says he denies Christ. He, he comes with smart, smart aleck answers like, hey, how many times should we forgive someone? Or, or who's the best? And you can just see the Lord going, oh, my gosh. All right, let's try this again. We all slip up. We're only human. We're only human. So you sat down, which is not an easy thing to do, and you wrote this book, The Christ Cure. You know what camera? Are we on camera two over here? And got a picture of that on the table there. I found this to be quite an interesting book when I got it and read it. And I'm going to read two comments from people that I know that have written wonderful praises about the uh, praise for the Christ cure. And one of them is Dr. Joseph Maroon, who's a local physician in Pittsburgh. For all who ever slipped into the devastating darkness of depression, anxiety, and PTSD, and for those seeking answers to our society's woes, therefore for all. And society has a lot of woes these days. And I was really uh, excited to see this one. And this is from uh, my college professor and, and, and a friend, Joseph Tassaro, PhD, Dr. Joe. He says, a must read for all, a comprehensive approach to the science of healing after, tra after trauma that is rich with examples from others. Dr. Murphy has treated as well as from his own recovery. And uh, uh, it's a book that's an easy read. And some of these books, when I first picked it up, thought it was going to be real medical. And with, with medicine, you can use some terms that are just way over people's heads. You didn't do that. You got the medical aspect apart, but this is not, I wouldn't call this a medical book. No, I do also refer to it as a handbook for the broken and the people who love them. Because a lot of times when we are broken, we don't, either acknowledge it, we don't see it, we don't really want to move forward on it, and yet there are friends and colleagues and other people uh, and family members who can help us through this. So this shows those stages and steps to help someone understand and heal from their trauma. So who should pick up this book and read it? Well, I think anybody who, in life, if you want to be prepared for trauma, and certainly if you have seen or experienced it, or still reeling from the effects of trauma and tragedy and still feeling anxious and depressed. But since all of us are there, I, I see it also as it's just good prevention, good preparation. But I also wrote it for counselors because what happens in the field of counseling is that uh, we know for people who have a, a faith, a strong faith and religion, not just I believe, but a strong faith, they get better, more prolonged. There's a, a higher rate, a better prognosis for them. But many counselors do not understand it and are not trained. In fact, in psychology, over half of psychologists won't ask any questions about religion. I think it's important because it's an important part of someone's life. Do you a believer, a certain religion? Do you practice it? Tell me how you practice it. Is it part of your life? <clears throat> and use that as part of their healing. But if a counselor has no idea about it, that person thinks, well, maybe this is taboo or, or stigma to talk about it. So this is also a book for counselors to read to know how to do it. And the third group is for clergy. So clients, counselors, clergy, because about 40 to 50 percent of people, when they have deep emotional concerns, will go to clergy and ask the rabbi, priest, pastor, whatever, about help. But the clergy says, I don't really know what to do. About 10 percent of them feel competent on it. So it also has a lot of very practical step-by-step -step issues to handle in the counseling process to help someone heal. So it's entitled The Christ Cure, but you don't have to be a Christian to read the book oh, no, no, or not to understand the book. Right. It, it uses those, those models within it, but um, you know, it's a lot of Old Testament, New Testament, and there's a lot of stories in there of uh, people that I knew about or knew, uh, and difficulties they had been through, and how they turned those into strengths for themselves. Some pretty powerful stories in there. And you do have some medical 
yeah, dogma we, in here. We got to talk a little bit about the brain because yeah. I want people to understand this isn't something that it's mystical and you can't touch. It, there's real things out there. And just as when your arm is broken, you put it in a cast. If you have an infection, you clean it up, you put the antibiotic on it. And the brain uh, has that inflammation or the difficulties. And if you don't work at it, you can't fix it. So, so your, your message in this book is? That you can heal, that there is hope, that things are not hopeless. That as, as you look at this, even if you don't see what's over the horizon, to have the hope that there is a better life for you, that even if you will never forget what has happened to you, you can turn that into a better strength, a better understanding, a better appreciation. Um, of all places, I remember in Winnie the Pooh, uh, I think it was, I think it was uh, the bear was once saying, what a blessing it is to have known someone for whom when they're gone, they'll be truly missed. Uh, and the, that's one way we can look at tragedy too. I, don't, I didn't quite quote that right, but the, that w when we have tragic difficulties in our life, we people we can appreciate it's there. But I want people to have a sense of hope. In fact, I talk about this book as a very painful book to write, but a very hopeful book to read. Because as I'm going through all these stories and difficulties, we can get bogged down the whole thing, but I, I'm a big believer that we can move forward. You have basically kind of a, a 10 step preamble right, to follow. Right. Can you review those steps for us? Sure. Um, <clears throat> the first steps are, and I, this is what I got more out of biblical principles, particularly I track the life of the Apostle Paul who was beaten and robbed multiple times, uh, beaten with rods three times, whipped 39 lashes five times, uh, shipwrecked 14 days in the ocean, bitten by snakes, the list goes on on stone and left for dead. Where if he went, people chased him down. And I thought, this guy should have had tremendous PTSD. And so I, in, in searching for writings, I found no one had written about that. So this is the first book that really also looks at the Apostle Paul, his problems, and why he didn't, why he was not overwhelmed with psychological disorders. But what I saw, there's four th stages he used all the time. <clears throat> One was he built his own resilience. And that was building a strength, um, having community people around him, uh, working on things in his own life to build up his resilience. Resilience is a skill set you have before the battle. The second thing is resistance. Resistance is a skill set you need in the battle. Courage, instead of being overwhelmed by fear. Um, uh, being vigilant, instead of being vulnerable. Uh, arming yourself with endurance and persistence, persistence being offense, endurance, defense, that he had these, this great skill set, which he wrote about prolifically, about how to handle things in the midst of a spiritual or physical fight. <clears throat> the third level is recovery. So uh, it, resilience before the fight, resistance in the fight, recovery after the, after the trauma. And recovery involves a number of things, and among them is um, the will to heal, uh, accepting guilt instead of shame, and aiming for forgiveness. And here you embrace those things. A person really has to reach out and say, I want to be healed. I want to learn to handle my guilt. I want to forgive and be forgiven. Uh, key aspects here to embrace. But there's a fourth step that was important for Paul and other people who could be more spiritual, and that is renewal. Paul has in, in his letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verse 2, he says, to be transformed by a renewing of the mind. That is really the key to modern psychology too. Change the way you think, renew the mind, and you can transform yourself. But his is on a much higher level, and there's four parts of that. One is, uh, so remember I said, you build, you arm, you embrace, but now this is accept. Accept faith, God exists. Accept trust that God's got things for a reason that we don't even know. That if, if there's people we want in our life and we want them there and they're taken out, probably for good reason as new people need to come in and help us. The third thing is grace, to understand we are loved permanently, always, despite our dysfunctions. We didn't have to earn it, it's there. And that's really tough for someone who hates themselves. How can anybody possibly love me? After all I've been through and all I've done and all my brokenness and all my mistakes, but the message of grace is, well, you are, period. Mm -hmm. And parents can understand this uh, kids may not necessarily understand it because they don't understand their parents, but a, I ask a parent says, when your kid messes up, do you still love them? Yeah. If your child got involved with drugs or alcohol, would you still love them? Yes. I'd want the best for them. Help. Exactly. Well, God wants the same thing for us. We mess up, mess they, up, get them. They probably wouldn't like them as much, but they'd still love yeah, them. Yeah, you're right. Still love them, but yeah. <clears throat> not like what you do. Yeah. So faith, trust, grace. And the fourth thing is having a mission. 
this is uh, was so important for Paul and so many of the people that I talk about in the book. When we decide where we're going in life, it's based upon all the things we learn in resilience, resistance, recovery, and renewal. Say, I need to put these into practice in my life and move forward. So those are the first four of the main stages for that. Then I go into six other things, which become a little more secular, but really have biblical roots too. Well, I know the show's coming nearer to the end over here, and we want to make sure that everyone knows where to get your book, The Christ Cure. Sure. So where can we find the book? Well, well one thing, I have a website. It's drtimmurphy.com. That's D-R Tim. Murphy, T-I-M-M-U-R-P-H-Y.com, DrTimMurphy.com. Um, <clears throat> so there I have also a website, I have podcasts, I have blogs. The podcasts, I continue to talk about issues in the book um, I, and I do interviews with people about mental health and those aspects too. You can also look at Amazon or other bookstores, uh, Christian books, Books A Million, order from them too. The podcasts have their own site that they would go to? Or is it yeah, you could be on Rumble or Spotify, Dr. Tim Murphy show. I think that's what it's a very unique name. A very unique name. <laughs> but <yeah. laughs> but uh, you can access them all through my website, yeah. drtimmurphy.com. Awesome. And, and I suggest you do that. You can also hear the radio show that Dr. Tim was on, my radio show, the Dr. Ed show, on Rumble and Spotify because they're archived there. So you can go there. And that was a very informative show. We received a lot of wonderful responses from you being on the radio show. And I know we'll get that on the TV show as well. So. The, this book is a wonderful thing to read, a wonderful thing to give to other people who may need some help, because it's about enlightenment and education and information. But can they take it a step further? Do you see patients in private practice? Well, I, I do. I, my uh, practice is focused on helping veterans, military, first responders, policemen, firemen, paramedics, and frontline medical people. Um, and. <clears throat> but my goal of writing this book is recognizing I'm not going to be able to do that forever. But I want people to understand the lessons that I've learned, quite frankly, at some of them the hard way. Um, and learn from that and learn what they can do. Uh, and there's counselors who can help with people. I never want people to say, <clears throat> I'm going to give up. There's nobody out there. But there's a lot people can do. I also do training with groups, too. I'll give group workshops on this where I'll walk people through the stages and do some pretty cool stuff with their lives and help show them what to do, too. And people get a hold of you on your website. Get hold of me on the website. Would you give that again? No, it's drtimmurphy.com, and there's a place to contact me, and I get emails through that. Awesome. I'm going <coughs> to ask Dr. Tim to sign his book. I didn't get him to sign it oh. the last time. We're at the end of the show, Dr. Tim Murphy. Okay. Hey, thank you so much for being on. I, I know you'll, you'll hear some good response from this show because people... I think you're going to gain an understanding they never had before. Remember, healthy pet is a happy pet. When you're healthy, you're happy as well. And you can find me every Saturday morning live at 9 a.m. at 12.50 a.m. The Answer on The Dr. Ed Show and on rumble.com. You search, you subscribe, and you share. And that's on rumble.com and Spotify and a bunch of other ones, The Dr. Ed Show. God bless. We'll talk to you next time.